Well, do, are we, are we going to introduce the thing we're doing together, or are you just going to make a video clip later of just you introducing it? Yeah, I like to do a little thing where we say, uh, hi, I'm Will, hi, I'm Chet, so that people have voices and names in case they're just running YouTube in the background and don't actually watch the videos. So they don't know who's who. So, um, hi. Uh, me and Will have these weekly discussions uh, about kind of what should be on the blog post. And that's really comes from, for us, is like the things we're talking about anyways all the time in the game and how we talk about the game and then what we're doing because we do play tests every week and we play every, almost every day internally. And so with that, we thought instead of just doing those and then outputting the blog post, which uh, is requires reading to consume, we thought we'd make these uh, little video clips of what our discussions are like and go from there. And then if you have any questions about the questions we raise, because we don't get everything in the blog posts that come up in the discussion. So if you have any other questions on these, you can just hit us up in the Discord. That's discord.gg slash Stray Bombay. And, uh, you know, we can include them next time. Yeah, we're in the Discord all the time talking about games, which it, it turns out is a bunch of what we're working on when we're actually making the game, too. We're kind of constantly having conversations about how we think the game should work until we're sure the image that's in my head and the image that's in your head and the image that's in everybody else's head are all the same image and aren't all different. So that then when somebody goes off and does the work, it, it all matches up. Yes. Yes. So there is like a top-down way to make games where there is someone up on top who's just like, and then do this. And you have this giant design document, right? Um, that's really... That's not exactly how we do it, huh? That That is really efficient. Our, our process is highly inefficient. And in fact, um, for new hires, we often stress that the thing that we care least about is efficiency in these discussions, but instead making sure everybody's on the same page, every voice is heard. Because often people have just really good ideas that you want to incorporate. I mean, even for writing, before I go to the recording studio, I always ask the whole team of like, does anybody have anything, that, you know, any ideas or things they want to work in? Because people often have good ideas and you could steal them, put your name on them and then take credit for them. It turns out you don't have too many chances to change dialogue after the recording session. Uh, we cut some audio up. In fact, we're cutting some audio up. Me and Charles uh, were like, hey, if we cut this line off of here and move this over here. We could use this this way. Lance, I've heard you're going <laughs> to yes. the elevator it it ends up uh <laughs> yelling out someone's name and then saying something after it you have a lot of leeway lance hey dude how's it going right like you know the, the lance is just catching their attention well it's pretty well established that lance is always the center of attention so it's not usually a problem for him to get you know a player's attention um but this week we're going to talk about enemy design now the common we'll talk about it another time the you know the the common alien uh, in this kind of game, they're they're always around. They're there for you to shoot. They're there to do damage to you. They're there to just be a general nuisance. But they don't do a whole lot special, at least that the players are usually aware of. Um, but what we are going to talk about is our elite designs, the specials. So um, we've talked a little, bit, a little bit about them in the past with the press. They've been in a couple of the trailers. Uh, they've shown up in our trailer, rather. Um, but we want to talk about why we design them the way they do, what we're trying to get them to get the players to do, what feelings we're trying to evoke in the players, and, and so on and so forth. Yeah, I mean, it's the starting point, right? So having worked on Love for Dead 1 and 2, and which is a four-player co-op game, uh, you learn a lot of how four players work together. And so then you realize kind of what works really well and what doesn't work well. Um, everything works well in chaos, chaos almost, that's true. So that's why you have the common, because they're coming in there, they're going crazy. So then if a hunter jumps on one of your friends in Left 4 Dead 2, hey, it's all of a sudden a struggle to get them off because you're dealing with all this other stuff. But if there's nothing else going on and a hunter jumps on him, it's really easy just to knock him off and kill him because he's doing damage right there, right by the rest of the players. So if you notice a lot of our design is how can we get the players to break up a little bit or even make bad choices and go somewhere that we can then do damage to them. It's a little bit of a different challenge now than it was with Left 4 Dead though, right? You know, the first time... I played Left 4 Dead. I did never seen a game like that before. And I didn't know how to play it. So I got in with three friends and I immediately wandered off into completely separate areas. We got all spread out and were immediately killed by the by the zombies. I, I think now players are trained to stay together better and it's shaped the way that we've designed the 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 elites especially. No, no, which is which is something we have to consider now. Cause so like we consider when we consider difficulty or intensity in our game, Left 4 Dead 1 was super hard 
when it first came out. It never changed. We all just got better at playing those games. That is literally like No Mercy was unsolvable for the longest time for everybody. Now everybody beats it all the time because we've learned to get better at these games. And so what can you do? What can you do that's new? What can you do that's different to kind of draw those players out, help them make bad decisions? Because that's kind of one of the things you want them to do. And yeah, so then we have to kind of step back and make make different kinds of creatures. For example, the spawner is a totally unique enemy to fight. It's it's just annoying. It's a jerk. It follows you around. You don't see it. It does things that you don't like. It's a bad time for the players. It's a great time for us. Yeah, so the spawner is the one that spawns uh, these little turrets that shoot at you. They don't do that much damage, but there's six at a time. They can definitely, on their own, kill you if you're not taking care of them. They're not the hardest thing to kill, but they'll just keep they'll just keep coming. And the spawner actually goes, runs off and hides. So this is one of the things of also why we designed the game is co-op first and not worrying about versus at the same time, because it's weird to play the spawner because if you were playing the spawner, you would just be going hiding in the bathroom, creating turrets all the time, right? Which is kind of what the spawner does. Well, I definitely know some players who would like to play that way. Sure. But so if you want to hang back, so we have the spawner hanging back. And so that's one of the things, and actually it has multiple different behaviors. So occasionally you'll get a spawner that just runs by you. And that's, that's what happens. But a lot of times it'll be hanging back and it'll be purposely goading you. Some spawners will actually occasionally tip their hand and show themselves for a second and then hide. And some will just hide and you have to figure out where they are. Yeah, it does this little cackling laugh that's just maddening. Yes, and it makes a noise that you are able to track it in the distance so that you can make this choice at some point when your other friend's helping someone up and they're over here looking through things through the crew quarters, you're gonna turn and be like, I'm gonna go take care of that spawner. I'm going to go kill it. And so then you go run it down, you kill it, and you realize all of a sudden you're far off from the rest of your team. We had one in a playtest the other day that just popped up behind us. I never saw it. It just kept following us through the level as we were progressing all, from the beginning of the level all the way to the end. And it just kept spawning a few turrets every few, every moment yeah. or two. So we'd hear the, the turrets rolling up, and the next thing they'd, know, they'd be shooting at us. It absorbed a ton of ammo. It was a constant hassle. In retrospect, we should have just turned around and gone back and killed it. Yes. But at the time, it didn't seem like it was worth the worth you know slowing down and 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 backtracking until it drives you nuts. But you know, also, so just all of these things have to work together because that's one of the things Amy, who's doing the AI driver, has done this really great thing of spawning from behind can often be super painful because you want to have you want to retreat back to safety. So she actually understands good teams versus bad teams, and one of the ways you make the game harder is having spawning from behind. So if you're a really bad team, you may not have anything ever spawn behind you. But if you're a good team, you may have the spawner spawn behind you. And then all of a sudden, you know, normally in like Love for Dead, we would attack the lead person. But everyone's already running towards the lead person. So it's going to naturally, they're going to be taken care of. But if you attack the rare per, rear person, all of a sudden everyone else has to stop and to make that decision of like, are we, are we leaving Will back there? Or we should go get Will. Let's go get Will. And so then you have these moments where you're actually backtracking to help your teammate. And it's actually slowing you down in a way that attacking the lead, you would think attacking the lead person who's going the fastest would do that. But it really, it's way more effective to occasionally hit the person in the back. It, it turns out you don't have to be faster than the aliens. You just have to be faster than the slowest person on your team. It's, it's shocking how effective this is. Even after playing the game a ton, I hear that laugh, I hear it cackle, and I know that if I don't go it down, it's going to just be a constant pain until somebody else finally goes and, and shoots it. But then I make the choice to go off on my own and hunt it down and make my own life miserable. So I guess it's a lose-lose. No, so that, well, and that's why it makes the cackle, because you want to have enough information that players can make a choice and let them make a choice. Like today, so what, what me and Will were playing. Uh, we were playing in the park, and we're at the end of the bridge that kind of goes over. It's this narrow place. You don't have a lot of information of what's passed, but the eggs, which are kind of like our equivalent of like, don't shoot them if you can help it and move around them. I thought, well, I'm just going to jump over them, not realizing there was a gooer and a spawner and a brute on the other side of that. Oh, and a, and a, and a grabber. Like they were all hiding, waiting for us to deal with the eggs. As I leap over midair, realize the bad decision, we all not realizing I'm jumping over, actually it's engaging the eggs and wait 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 that's not what actually happened i was trying to sneak around the eggs you leapt over me guns blazing completely blew up the plan and then just 
went down like a light was turned off. It, it was mauled. I was mauled very heavily. I paid the price. Oh, and then a uh, flasher even came by to add insult to injury. It was an amazing moment, though. Lots of drama. Uh, you know, I was solving a minor problem. You turned it into a major problem and were just immediately knocked. And then the rest of us jumped in and hucked all of our grenades, fired our special weapons, some incredible displays of skill on my part. And uh, I saved you at the last possible second. I believe I said, oh, I'm dead. Don't worry about me. And then you saved me. So, yeah. Yeah, that was good. Can we talk about the flasher a bit? So, flasher, flashes. I'm really good at naming things, <laughs> literally. Uh, but so, um, it, what it's trying to do is rob you of information. So, it takes away visual information from you and can send enemies at you that you simply can't see. You know, almost always in the first play test when we have new players, which is why you always have to take new players information and understand it it's sort of like oh my god it's overpowering there's no way you can handle it oh my god it's the worst and occasionally you'll get two of them and it's really crazy but you eventually learn oh there's this bright spot to it if you kind of concentrate you can see it enough that you can start shooting it or you can just start shooting it and seeing where you're hitting and then let loose it turns out to just unload on the brightest spot on the screen is a valid tactic yeah you know and some of that comes from playing games where smoke's actually effectively used and how that changes the game and how that feels. Um, and so really just wanted to bring that into a creature that said, hey, if we're aliens, we're boarding the ship, we're taking the ship over, what's our version of Blitzkrieg? How are we taking over this massive ship so quickly? Well, we have these holy crazy weapons that we can use and one of them is the flasher. The neat thing to me about the flasher is that it's really difficult for new players but it's a high priority for me still when it pops up in the game. You know, a new player sees it, they suddenly can't see anything on the screen, they don't know where they're where they're getting hit from, they don't know who's shooting at them, and they don't even know really what to shoot to deal with it. After a few sessions, that that kind of it becomes less difficult for them, right? They they know, oh hey, that's a flasher, I need to figure out where it is and kill it. And a few sessions after that, they figure out, oh yeah, shoot the shoot the bright spot. It it you know, it'll solve the problem. But it's still, even after playing hundreds of hours of the game, it's still a, oh yeah, I got to kill this thing really quick because it makes everything else more difficult. Um, it's not, however, a, oh wow, if we don't kill this thing, we're hosed enemy like the Gooper. Yes. So the Gooper, a uh, lot of, lot of, lot of Verge Gooper was not a good name, ends up. Uh, Gooper is better. Um, the, char the, the, the characters have a lot of discussion over this name. Just so the names, um, this is this thing that happens in war that you actually just tell, say your enemy by name essentially at first, and then eventually you get your nicknames to them as you become more familiar with them. So I actually want the names to change over time. Right now it is a gooper. Um, or gooer. What is the canonical name for the gooper, eh, Chet? Depends the character. Um, but so with that is we wanted a, we wanted a creature that had a ranged weapon that could immobilize you. There's a couple things there is one, that means it can immobilize multiple people. So that means you need to take that thing out. You can't just go help your friend. But to help with that, um, you don't actually have, have to get up to your friend to save them. You can actually kind of be in the distance and shoot the goo off of them. And that was another thing I wanted to be able to do was at a range, be able to help your friend. So you always have this moment in the game, you see your friend either down, incapacitated, or in a sense good, and you want to be able to help them. But so how can you help them when you're in a really big space and they're a far distance away? You know, often we would see this frustration where players are trying to get to somebody who got like grabbed by the hunter and left for dead. And they said this frustration of trying to get through all the common to get to them. So how do we let you have that moment of savior, but from a distance? And so that's it. You can shoot it off. And so players, new players often worry that they're doing damage to the other player. You don't. There's actually a grace period as the goo comes off you that you can keep shooting. Um, and because we want you to do that. Well, we talked about the Left 4 Dead Hunter a bit, which is a huge threat if you're making a poor decision and you're off on your own. But it's a minor annoyance if it pounces you when you're in the middle of your group. Uh, you know, they just walk up and melee it off of you. It's no problem. The thing I love about our Gooper is that it's maybe more dangerous in the middle of a big horde than it is when you're off by yourself. Or they're standing in goo. So they've been gooed. They can't move. And your quickest way to solve them, because you don't have a direct line of fire, is set the goo on fire. No! Because the goo will burn off them before they die and they'll be able to escape. That's a terrible solution for bad people, Chet. This is why you take the perk when you play with me that you do less that fire does less damage. It is always the right perk to take. Okay, there are two perks you always take. The headshots that make aliens explode, mwah, Yes. and the anti-Chet fire protection perk. 
hundred percent of the time. That's fair. I think that's as good a place as any to wrap it up for today. I, I think, yeah, we will be talking about the other specials later and how we think about that. But, you know, um, underlying all the creature design always comes from what do we want the players to do and behave and what are we trying to change in their behavior? And so we can get into the other ones later and what they do. I think that's a good good cover of that. I don't know. But again, um, if you want us to talk about something else or cover something else, um, discord.gg slash Bombay. Oh, you also, also, you sign up there. You know what you can do? You can play test. Yeah, we're, we're constantly pulling players in from the Discord. Uh, if you go to discord.gg slash straybombay, when you get the welcome page, it has a couple of things in there that you should do. One of them tells you exactly how to sign up to be a beta tester uh, uh, for our observed play tests. If you choose to click through that, like everybody always does, just ask in general and they'll point you in the right direction. Yes. Be yeah, because it's, it's us working and Amy, who does the drivers, like, hey, I'd really like to test this change I went in. Well, we can test it and have what really skilled players can do or people who know the game well. But what it would new, how would new players react to this? And her AI driver just does that whole gambit, which we'll have a whole, whole blog post about. Um, so I don't want to get too much into that. But yeah, it's fun. So if you, if you join the Discord, um, you can jump into our play tests. Maybe, maybe. And yeah, we're we're totally recruiting modders too. There are instructions in the Discord for how to sign up for that. Uh, but again, just post in general and somebody will help you out probably. There you go. That's the most common way. Yeah, yeah. And for the mods, um, we already have modders working. They already have access to stuff and uh, going away because cost that's important. So yeah, I, I guys, I feel I have this feeling like this this first this first video should encompass every single thing we've ever talked about. Which I should probably just stop talking. We should say, hey, this is good for this week, and we'll have more next week. <laughs>